Welcome to Cabin Fever Astronomy. My name is Joe Childers. I'm an astronomer at the Budenschaft Museum of Discovery in Dayton, Ohio. Today's episode is about Sirius. I'm not joking, that's seriously what we're going to be talking about. This is the brightest star in the night sky. Only the sun is a star that appears brighter from the Earth. Because it's so bright, it's easy to find. So that's our first segment tonight, the sky tonight. We'll be showing you how to find the star. You can see it in twilight, roughly 20 minutes to half an hour after sunset. Now, it's not as bright as Venus, but it's brighter, like I said, than any other star. So to, in uh, March and April, you look after sunset, it'll be in the south. Uh, depending on your latitude, it'll be medium height, or if you're a little bit farther south, higher, or if you're in the north, it'll be a little bit lower. But here from Dayton, Ohio at latitude 40, I would say it's about 35 degrees above the southern horizon. And it'll be the first star visible. And there's no planets nearby. So when you first see something that looks like a star down there, again, about roughly half an hour after sunset, that is Sirius. As spring goes on, it'll be more in the southwest after sunset. But still, being bright as it is, and there are never any planets near Sirius, so it shouldn't be that hard to find. Once you get into the night sky, you can use Orion, which was yesterday's uh, topic, to find Sirius, if for some reason this insanely bright star doesn't just jump out at you. So we start with the constellation of Orion, which is on the right here, and specifically Orion's belt, those three stars in a row. We follow them to the left, so down and to the left to Sirius. That is not the only way, though, that you can use Orion to find Sirius. You can also use the red star that's, Be that's Orion's shoulder, Betelgeuse, and it is part of the winter triangle with the star Procyon. This is also a way to, once you find Sirius, and then Procyon is usually the next one visible if you're looking for the, these stars in twilight, you can use this equilateral triangle to find Betelgeuse. Here is the constellation or the stick figure that you use. Technically, this would be an asterism. So the stick figure that you use connect the dot style is the asterism. The constellation is one of the 88 regions of the sky that has the Latin name Canis Major, meaning big dog. So Sirius is the bright star. It's also called the dog star, and here is why. It's like the tag on the collar of the dog. And I always kind of think of this as more like a wiener dog than a big dog because it has such a long body and a pointy nose. But the bright stars here, the ones that are not shown as dots, but as, as stars of some sort of or another, those are visible even in the city. And here are their names. We have Aludra on the tail, Wesen and Adara are the hindquarters, Furud and Mirzam are two of the feet. Learning star names is something that you can do free. Uh, and you go one constellation at a time, and it's pretty quickly that you can build up a catalog of, I know what that star's name is, I know what that star's name is. And that's actually kind of fun. I mean, I haven't gotten my telescope out in quite a while, but each night I'm looking up and finding stars and identifying them. So that's kind of what I am personally am doing for my amateur astronomy right now. If, however, you have binoculars, Okay, I was got off my script here. This Omicron 2 um, Canis Majoris, so that star that's on the middle of the back, is one of the most luminous stars known. That means how much brightness it makes. It makes uh, 22,000 times more light output than the sun does. But even though it's so faint comparatively, it is, that means it's, pretty far away, turns out to be 2,800 light years away. Now's the time to talk about binoculars. Using binoculars, you can find things in the constellation 
that are not necessarily visible to the naked eye. The first of these are going to show you three uh, star clusters. Technically these are open clusters. These are all stars that came from the same birth nebula, but it hasn't been long enough for them to disperse away. And so there are um, about a hundred or so stars uh, all just packed together in a uh, will look like a cloud to your naked eyes and with binoculars you'll be able to tell some of them. Here is one of them. It is in the middle of the uh, chest cavity of the dog, so kind of like where the lungs or the heart would be. And then there are two more by the base of the tail. And these three star clusters all look pretty nicely in binoculars. The tail star, Aludra, is a double star. That means that if you look at it with your binoculars, what looks like one star to your eyes will turn into two stars in the binoculars. And there are a few other binocular um, double stars in this constellation, but they're not nearly as easy to find um, as Aludra the tail star. Next, we are going to talk about the Sirius star system, not what it looks like to us from Earth, but uh, pretending to travel there and to study it. This is what it looks like. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. And it's, of course, very bright. Those four lines that you see are coming from the, um, the parts of the telescope that are holding up one of the mirrors. And the Hubble Space Telescope uses two mirrors, and those are the supports for the secondary mirror. Here's how it compares to the sun. You can see it's bigger. It's 1.7 times as wide. The blue color here, compared to the yellow color of the sun, means that it's hotter, similar to how the outer parts of a candle flame are the yellowish, and then right next to the wick is the blue. Turns out it's also 1.7 times hotter than the sun. It's roughly twice as massive, so it means it's a, if it's only um, 1.7 times as wide, but twice as massive. And lastly, it's 25 times brighter. That comes from being hot, but also from the surface area. But if you noticed a little dot on the previous Hubble picture, that tells you that there is something else in the system. And that is a white dwarf companion. You can see that tiny little dot down to the lower right of the Sirius picture here. And that's roughly to scale. It's not as wide as the Earth. It's actually about the size of the planet Venus. But it has more mass than the Sun. Whereas the um, the Earth is one millionth the size of the Sun, but having a Sun's worth of mass in that tiny volume means that it's very, very dense. The distance from Sirius A, the bright star, to Sirius B, the white dwarf, is roughly the same distance as from the Sun to the planet Uranus. But because the orbit is pretty eccentric, that means it looks more like an oval than a circle, that's just the average distance, and sometimes it's closer, and sometimes it's farther away. It takes about 50 years for the white dwarf and the um, bright star to orbit one another. If we were to go to Sirius, and now you know what that little dot there to the lower left is, that's the white dwarf, it would take um, it, well, it's 8.6 light years away, so that means that at the speed of light, it takes 8.6 years to get there. But since that is the absolute fastest that you can go in the universe, any spaceship would take longer. And for the technology that we have now, very, very, very much longer. But still, 8.6 light years is not at all far away as far as stars are concerned. And it is the closest star to the sun that is significantly more luminous or brighter than the sun. Now, Alpha Centauri, uh, which is about half the distance, is only a little bit brighter than our sun 
but Sirius here is 25 times brighter. And the white dwarf companion is the closest white dwarf to the Earth. Next we're going to be talking about the white dwarfs itself. What is makes them so weird? What is special about them compared to other stars? Two things that we're going to talk about. First of all, where do they come from? So at what stage in a star's life cycle might it be a white dwarf? And then why is it so dense? We talked earlier about the mass of the sun squished down into the volume of planet Earth. We'll start off with a small star's life cycle. Now by small star, I mean one that has the same amount of mass as the sun or less or up to roughly six to eight times the mass of the sun. These smaller stars do not end their life as a supernova. Most of their lifespan is spent uh, as a normal star. That's where the sun is right now. That would be at the lower left of this chain. The sun has not yet run out of hydrogen in the core for the nuclear fusion that is creating the, uh, the light and heat. So when the hydrogen runs out in the middle of that core, which will be for the sun roughly three to or four billion years from now, then it begins to expand it, as it starts to fuse hydrogen in outer layers of the star. Eventually, when it's pretty much used up all of the hydrogen that it can, and in some cases will start fusing helium into carbon and oxygen, it ends up at the red giant stage. And this is the end of its um, life as a bright star. Then the outer atmosphere is lost, shed out into space, forms what's called a planetary nebula. Has nothing to do with planets like Earth, uh, Venus, and Jupiter. But instead, in very early telescopes, it looked like a planet. But now that we have better telescopes, we can see that it's a ring or an hourglass shape made of gases that were lost from the uh, red giant star. And then the white dwarf is the leftover core of that star. So our sun will end up as a white dwarf star. And it will have a planetary nebula around it. And these will all happen roughly five to seven billion years from now. What about the white dwarf itself? Why is it so dense? Well, the question that we have to ask is, why don't stars collapse from their own gravity? Stars are very massive, so they do have a lot of gravity, certainly compared to the amount of gravity that we're used to here on the surface of the Earth. And gases are squishable. Uh, you can compress a gas quite a bit. And so what keeps the gravity of the star from just squishing it into uh, nothingness, uh, into a black hole. Well, in the same way that we can blow up a balloon, that gives us an analogy for what's going on. The skin of the balloon, being rubber, wants to shrink. So that has the role of gravity. But the air on the inside is pushing back because gases want to expand. And so the size of the balloon is where the contraction of the skin of the balloon and the outward pressure of the air inside the balloon balance. And as the girl here blows more air into it, that pressure will increase and it will expand. As it expands, the uh, amount of of wanting to compress, the, the, the degree that the skin wants to get smaller, as it gets stretched more, it's pushing back, and then it'll find a new equilibrium size. In a star, we have gravity pulling it in, like we've talked about, and then it's heat that opposes gravity. It's not very easy to see this um, on the Earth or like in your kitchen or something like that, but gases, when they heat up, do expand. And it's extremely hot in the center of a, of a star, millions of degrees. And so that uh, heat causing the gases to want to expand 
is what balances out how the large amount of gas mass is wanting to squish the star. And so the size of a star is the balance between how hot it is on the inside and how much mass it has. But towards the end of a star's life, when it's in the red giant phase, this does not become enough. Heat pressure will not keep it uh, the right, the size that it wants. And so it does start to shrink. But eventually, when it gets shrunk small enough, a new type of pressure comes in. This is called electron degeneracy pressure. And I won't go into more explanation of that except to say it's a quantum mechanics weirdness. But eventually the gases are going to resist being squished next to each other, not because they're hot, but because the electrons don't want to get too close to one another. That's a gross simplification, but you can look up electron degeneracy pressure to um, read some other articles online about how that works. So the electron degeneracy pressure doesn't kick in until it's extremely dense. How dense? Well, lead is what we commonly think of as a dense material here on Earth. A white dwarf is 88 times denser than lead. Not only that, here is a um, everyday example. Take a 747 jet stuff it into a coffee cup. That is the density of a white dwarf. Even so, neutron stars, which come from heavier stars to start with, are even denser than that. Our last segment is always talking about a spacecraft that is studying the universe is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This is actually a telescope. The rings that you see on the right-hand side under that door that lifted up around the triangle looking thing, that is where the X-rays enter. And uh, the next slide will show us how they are focused. But the Chandra is uh, the name of a scientist who figured out how large a white dwarf can become. And uh, that's name, the limit for that mass, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, is named after him. Here is how the telescope works. You can't bounce um, light rays off the, a flat mirror at the back or even a slightly curved one because x-rays will go right through. The only way that you can focus them with a mirror is to have them glance off at uh, very shallow angles of incidence. And so we have these nested curved surfaces that um, focus the x-rays down to the detection box on the left just by gradually nudging them to change their distance a little small angle. Compared to a uh, visual light telescope, it's not very wide, but because x-rays have a smaller wavelength, it has a similar resolution. What does Chandra have to do with Sirius? Sirius is uh, very hot. X-rays are emitted by very hot objects. Turns out that the white dwarf is roughly uh, three and a half times hotter than the normal star that we can see. So here is what Sirius looks like in visible light. Again, the one that we see in the night sky is the bright one in the center, and the um, little tiny dot to the lower left is the white dwarf. But in X-rays, using the Chandra Space Telescope, it's the white dwarf that looks brighter. And the star that we think of as Sirius is dimmer. And once again, the six spikes there are coming from the um, me mechanics in the space telescope that are holding the mirrors in place. So thank you for watching our cabin fever astronomy about the star Sirius. I hope that you have clear skies and can look at that star tonight and maybe even grab your binoculars and see some of those open clusters and that um, double star. This is Joe Childers at the Boonshop Museum of Discovery signing off for Wednesday.